Welcome to Risk Roundup. Risk-based authentication, a non-static authentication system which considers the profile of digital users requesting access to the system to determine the risk score in real time has been getting a lot of attention. Moreover, a trend is emerging of integrating biometric data with real-time authentication processes. While there are many different user models emerging for biometric identification of digital users, integration of machine learning brings significant potential to human user identification and authentication. While there are two major forms of biometrics, those based on uh, physiological attributes and those based on behavioral attributes that are being applied, each class of biometrics being, brings its own sets of risk and rewards. To discuss one such application, I'm delighted to welcome Ian Patterson to this round of. Ian is the CEO of Plurilog that has developed an identity authentication tool based on real-time behavioral biometrics pattern. The company is based in Canada. Welcome, Ian. We are honored to have you on Risk Round, though. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Wonderful, Ian. So even today, most computer systems are secure using a login ID and password. When computers are connected to the internet, they become more vulnerable as more connected machines are available to attack them. Where do you see vulnerabilities and what is required to ensure secure digital user access? Well, it's a good question. And I think what we're seeing more and more is that data breaches are the result of compromised identities. So the statistics change year to year, but on average, it's four out of five data breaches are the result of a lost or stolen credential. And so I think that the, the challenge we're running into is that traditional authentication, uh, which has relied on a shared secret, is not sufficient to, to protect uh, and safeguard personally identifiable information personal health information or other forms of sensitive data. So what we've done at Pluralock is leverage uh, behavioral biometrics technologies as a second layer uh, to validate that it's in fact the right person who's accessing the right data at the right time. And by leveraging that behavioral biometrics, we're able to provide a, a continuous form of authentication that in most cases is completely invisible to the user. So in contrast to traditional uh, token-based or hardware-based uh, authentication, which is quite, uh, can be quite frustrating both for the users as well as the administrators. What we found is that behavioral biometrics offers us a way of providing that authentication without incurring uh, any friction on behalf of that user. I see. So uh, you said, you know, that is an invisible layer. You use the bio behavioral biometrics as an invisible layer. So how many layers are there in your system and how does it enhance the level of security for user identification and authentication when they try to access any computer system, any sensitive you know, system? Yeah, it's a good question. So we make the distinction between static authentication, which would be something like a, a login and password or a, a second factor authentication step up request and then continuous authentication. Um, now, at Plurilock, we actually do both. We have two different products. We have Plurilock Adapt, which is our initial authentication product. And there, what we're doing is when a user goes to type in their login and password, we're monitoring invisibly how that user is typing in their credentials, how they are using the mouse, the specific location that they're connecting from, and additional risk factors. So some, some, some signals, for instance, would be things like we look at uh, the impossible travel problem. So if we've seen a user connect from Singapore uh, and they were currently connecting from Seattle and there was only five minutes between their last connection and the current connection, we calculate the possible travel time from Singapore to Seattle. And then if it's physically impossible, um, then we know that there's something suspicious there. So those would be the types of signals. We build those together into a risk profile or a risk score. And then that ultimately will govern whether we grant access for that user into the, the privileged system. Now that's, the, that's our Plurilock Adapt product. And so that forms the basis for meeting 2FA requirements um, and providing strong authentication. After they're in, then that's where our Plurilock, Plurilock Defend product takes over. And there we're monitoring every three to five seconds based on how a user is typing on keyboard, how they're moving a mouse and how they're operating throughout the day. And so really the, the question then is for uh, particularly in today's environment, 
with the COVID-19 situation, everybody's working remotely, everybody's working from home, and businesses no longer have good physical security over their employees and over their, their employees' access to data. And so the question becomes, as a, as a chief information security officer, how are you validating that the person who logged in at nine o'clock in the morning to start work is still the same person at 11 o'clock in the morning or at two o'clock in the afternoon or at five o'clock in the afternoon. And so Player Lock Defend is designed to provide a form of continuous authentication or continuous identity assurance where we're constantly validating to make sure that it's the right person who's supposed to be on that device invisibly in the background. Yes, no, that I, I hear your points there. So what are the criteria that you used uh, in your company to determine which biometrics variables you want to consider for this identification system? Well, it's, it's really dependent on what's available to us. So we have uh, existing models for things like keystroke dynamics, and that would be looking at how your fingers type on the keyboard. Now, it's important to note that we don't look at the contents. So you can be typing any language, you could be working in Excel, you could be playing a video game. To us, the contents of what you do doesn't matter. And in fact, for privacy reasons, we strip it out and we actually don't look at the contents of what's being typed in. However, what we are looking for is the speed, rhythm, and cadence of how an operator or how a user is operating on that device. So to give you an example of that, if I'm typing, uh, if I'm typing the, the company name Pluralock, my, my keys will, will, I'll first press down the P key. And so the time that it takes my finger to press down that P key and release it, that would be called the dwell time. And my specific dwell time for that key has a certain amount of uniqueness in it. The sure. Time... sure, but uh, let me interrupt here. But if you're talking about keystroke, keystrokes, you know, then it depends on the keyboard, you know. It, it's not necessary that it will have the same impact. If you're using different keyboards, it will have different kinds of keystrokes. So would that not interfere into how a, it adds to your, you know, uh, assessment? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's one that we get quite frequently. What, what our models have been able to do is we're able to abstract away from different keyboards. So we actually have a master keyboard profile, which is generic to whatever keyboard you're typing on. Now, the exception there is if you're typing on, let's say, a QWERTY keyboard in the morning and then a Dvorak keyboard where the keys are completely laid out in a different fashion, that's, that's, a, that's an edge case. But in terms of my typing on a Bluetooth keyboard sometimes, and then maybe I sit down at my laptop, um, are able, our models are able to accommodate that change. Um, so it's, you know, it's something that really only comes from experience. The, we've been doing this since 2016, and then even earlier than that when we were still in the lab. Um, and so part of that real world experience has been able to accommodate for these types of edge cases. Yes, no, I understand. So you, you mentioned in your response earlier that depending on what data is available, you use that, you know, in, in, the, in the invisible layer, because so it, it, are you using a whole set of different behavior biometrics uh, variables? So it depends on, you know, what situation it is, where the person is, based on that you use, you know, which ones need to be used, or is it like all of them are running in the background and assessing, you know, in the real time? Well, so we're looking at what data is available to us. So an example would be keystroke dynamics, which we've already talked about. We also have models for mouse activity. So we can look at the, uh, the movement, the direction of movement, the speed of movement, and then the change in speed, change in direction of movement for the cursor. We also look at clicks, double clicks, scrolls. So those are signals that we can consume from mouse. Um, we mentioned the keyboard. If there's a mobile device, there may be additional sensors that we can incorporate. So things like the accelerometer, the gyroscope, these are all signals that we're able to incorporate. The crucial piece though, is that we're able to make an authentication decision regardless of what modality you're, you're operating on. So if you're just on a, a standard desktop and the only thing that we see is, is keystroke input, because that's the only thing you're doing, you're just typing an email, we're able to make that authentication decision. If you're changing from, from just keyboard to some mouse work, uh, and then maybe you, you move to your tablet, then we can incorporate that data as well. So it depends really on the context of what the user is doing, then we're gonna consume that data and then make that authentication decision. Now it's important to note as well that we're looking at the, the risk or the severity 
of the data that's being accessed. So we may be, um, we may score it more leniently if you are a low risk user, for instance, and you don't actually have access to sensitive data, right? And so there's, there's an ability to tune up or down the sensitivity based on the level of risk that is, um, that is at play. I see. So I, I, I saw you, I looked at your website, I reviewed the information on that. It seems that not only the keyboard uh, that you are using, the mouse actions, but you also incorporate physical posture, geographic location, latency patterns, keystroke pattern, uh, touch, touch screen gestures, ambient light, network uh, packets, time of day, all of these different variables you considered. And the pattern, you know, of course, you know, in how you uh, make an assessment, how your system makes an assessment. So, uh, what information is extracted from each of these variables, and how does it get integrated into the uh, algorithm? Because, of course, there is in the background there is an algorithm running that evaluates all this, right? So, what information is extracted in real time and assessed to be able to make that intelligent decision by the uh, algorithm that this is the individual who he says uh, he or she says that uh, is. Well, so we look at the the individual inputs. So when we when we're talking about our models, what we mean is that we have a model for keystroke dynamics. We have a model for geo velocity, which is what we call the impossible travel problem. So these are individual models that are looking at those discrete inputs. At the at the server level. Um, where, where all the data goes back to, then we're, we're looking at uh, an aggregate of these individual models, and then we, we come up with a, an overall risk score. The benefit of doing it this way is that we're able to really fine tune those models to both the data that we have available to us, um, as well as we can also flag uh, very specific types of attacks. Um, so for instance, on, on the desktop, um, you know, it's common that there would be a remote access Trojan on that desktop. Um, and so we can look at that specific type of attack. We can also look uh, for um, rogue USB peripheral devices. So the, the brand name is called Rubber Ducky, but it's where you have a USB, um, it looks like a, a, you know, a USB dongle for, for just transferring files, um, but it actually behaves as a, as a rogue keyboard input device. So those would be types of individual attacks that we can look at. At the, at the aggregate level, when we're calculating that overall risk score, then we'll take the, the summation of those individual input models, because we may not have all of them, right? If, if the user's typing on the keyboard, we don't actually have access to any other data because there's nothing to, to make a decision on. And then we'll, we'll conduct an overall, um, uh, or we'll, we'll make an overall risk decision. But I think really the, the key part here is we, we're trying to be as, as flexible as possible because the reality is in today's work environment, work takes place in many different locations. It takes place in many different uh, functions. And so even, even for a specific worker, uh, the, the workload that they have is gonna change dramatically. So the, the example I always use is somebody in an accounting department in a public company. What they do in the middle of the quarter looks very different than what they do at the end of the quarter, you know, particularly when it's com coming time to, to file the, the quarterly reports, you know, they're, they're up late, they're working late, and so it could appear um, suspicious. And so you, the systems need to be able to account for that type of variability. I see, I hear you. So uh, what is the initial data? How is the initial data collected for your system to create user profile? And how does that enrollment process look like? Mm -hmm. So enrollment is, is an important part of any machine learning system because you need good quality data in order to build that initial profile and ensure that profile is robust. So what we do is we go through a specific training period. For us, it can be done in as little as 20 minutes where we're, we're observing how a user behaves in an ordinary environment. Um, depending on the, uh, on the customer site, we can do that in a couple different ways. We can do that um, as, an actual, uh, as an actual process where the, the end user is prompted with some prompts um, and they, they know what's going on. They're able to build that profile in a, in a very short amount of time and then they go on and, and go about their day. Um, in other customer environments, uh, we're able to do that over a slightly longer period of time, uh, typically over a couple of, couple of days, and it does not require the active participation of the end user. 
So there's some pros and cons to why you'd want to go one route versus the other. Um, we're able to support both. And so it just comes down to what is the risk that we're trying to protect against? Is it sensitive data somewhere? Is it a sensitive system? Um, what is the actual uh, attack surface of that business? Are we concerned about more of an insider threat? Uh, or or do we, are we operating with a trusted group of uh, end users and we're concerned more about external attackers? And that, and that becomes part of the process um, of deployment and enrollment. And then, of course, after, after those profiles are built, then, uh, you know, continuously those profiles are, are updated on a regular basis, uh, invisibly in the background. So even once those profiles are, are created initially, uh, they're constantly getting added to and appended and, and uh, getting more accurate over time. I see. So is this a one-time collection of the data or is there a need for ongoing collection of this behavioral you know, data? Yeah, there's always need for ongoing collection and, and fine tuning, um, largely because with behavioral biometrics, we're looking at human behavior, which is inherently variable. So even if you think of, if you think of just typing a password as a very basic example, when you first learn your password, uh, you usually type it a little bit slower. You're a little bit more intentional uh, because you're either uh, reading it off something, maybe that little yellow sticky note, uh, one hopes not, but in, in a lot of cases, that's that's what's happening, or or you're just remembering it, um, and then you're you're typing it in. As time goes on, that that sequence of typing in that password or even your email address, if if you want to use that example, becomes quicker and quicker and quicker. And so there's there's inherent organic drift that occurs for any human behavior as you develop muscle memory, as you get better over time. And so the systems have to be able to accommodate for that organic drift, but also be able to uh, relearn what that new process is, or that new pattern is, and then append that back to the profile and then have a, have a capability of dropping off the, the older legacy behavior. So that's critically important for any machine learning system. It's doubly so for behavioral biometric systems when you're, when you're trying to account for that human variability. Right, so when you, are, when you devise this uh, biometric solution, there is always uh, a trade-off between being overly stringent, rejecting every attempt you know, to log in and being overly lenient in allowing you know, some you know, imposters to access the computer. So how is that algorithm achieving this balance because there will be false positives, there will be false negatives, you know, when and someone is trying to access the system. So how is that balance achieved? Yeah, it's a good question. What we found particularly within regulated institutions, so this could be banks or power plants, hedge funds, um, you know, these, these are typical customers for us. There's typically a, a distinction between various classes of users. So in, in traditional IT, we have a concept of uh, of a privileged access, um, where you'll have a series of, of individuals, maybe they're system administrators, maybe they're um, you know, people who are able to uh, affect wire transfers of $10 million at a time, but you have this class of users who are privileged and you wanna treat them differently. You're also likely gonna have classes of users who are um, maybe, maybe uh, uh, think, think of like a teller and a bank where there's existing security controls in place that require uh, manager approvals or um, or there's there's other security controls in place and so the the really important part is being able to operate a system that can be configured for those different classes of users and then operate in a different way so for us we have a concept of of different groups of users and then we can tune the configuration for those classes of users. So for the privileged access uh, folks that I mentioned, you may actually accept a higher level of false positives because the danger of if you let the wrong person in to do the wrong thing um, is that much higher. And that might be acceptable for that class. In a lot of cases too, for privileged access, um, it's the, the work that they're doing is less frequent. So it's not that they're in there eight hours a day affecting wire transfers. Um, but it's only on, on a, a periodic or occasional basis. And so you can, you can develop the system and, and customize it for that. On the other hand, uh, with, with, a, um, uh, with more of a larger volume of users uh, who, who have inherently less access to begin with, then you're able to, to treat them accordingly. Um, perhaps you can let in a, 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 you know, you can accept a, a lower threshold for those users. So that's the first part. 
But then the second part is what do you actually do when you detect something suspicious? What do you do when there's uh, clearly somebody who's impersonating somebody else or this account has been taken over or, or, or that type of thing? So for us, there's, we've come up with two, two distinct workflows. The first workflow is an active defense workflow. And so that's when we've detected something anomalous on a user account. We have uh, some confirmationary events. So it's not just that, hey, suddenly there's something suspicious, but we've detected for the last five seconds and then the next five seconds and then the next five seconds that there's clearly a trend here of, of there being anomalous activity. Um, we're able to uh, first send an alert to that end user's uh, side, side device. So it could be their mobile phone, uh, it could be their voice over IP uh, connected uh, uh, desk phone, and we're able to challenge that user. And so really what we're saying is, look, user, there's something suspicious on such and such host name. Um, are you you? And if they're able to say, yes, it's me, based on the mobile app or the SMS or the phone, um, then we're able to mark that as a false alarm and then move on. If they fail to respond or if they say, no, it's not me, um, then we're able to lock down that device, potentially separate it from the network entirely. Um, and then we're also notifying the security operations center, the SOC or the security team while that's taking place. So that's more of an active defense mode. And that would be very applicable for organizations who are already using uh, DLP software, data loss prevention software, or as part of an insider threat program. So that would be the active defense. The, the second workflow is actually, uh, it's a bit reversed. And so think of it um, in terms of reducing login friction or, or getting to a, a passwordless experience. And so the way that that one works is, is the opposite. We're not looking for anomalous behavior. We're actually looking for high confidence that you're the right person. So if I were to go in using our endpoint agent um, that's, on a, that's on a desktop device, and I go to access my, my Office 365. Um, rather than getting prompted for an additional authentication for logging into Office 365, in the background, we're actually checking our endpoint agent to say, has Ian been successfully validated in the last 30 seconds? And if we have high confidence that Ian is in fact Ian, then the user doesn't get prompted when they try and log into that sensitive system. And it could be Office 365, it could be your payroll system, it could be anything else. And so from a user's perspective, they actually have less authentication friction. From their perspective, they're just getting let in. In fact, they've, as far as they're concerned, they, they weren't even prompted for authentication. But in the background, we actually have checked their biometric profile. We've ensured that it's the right person. And then most importantly, we have a log to show that yes, it was Ian, logging in under Ian's account. So it was Ian's biometric profile, logging in under Ian's account from this device on this day, and here's the data that he accessed. And so the, the organization, the, the company, has access to those logs and is able to trace back to say, look, we can prove nobody had access to sensitive data. Here are the logs, here's the biometric proof. So it's, it's interesting in that we've, we've sort of flipped from an active defense, we wanna lock people out and we're, we're gonna proactively take action to uh, more of a permissive model where we're trying to reduce overall friction and we're trying to eliminate passwords from an end user's workday. No, sure. I mean, eliminating password is a necessity. There is no doubt about that. But what is the precision of your technology? Have you tested your algorithm and evaluated its efficacy with uh, other authentication techniques? Yeah, of course. And not only have we done that, but we've also had third parties do that. And in fact, in, in our standard sales process, we'll have, uh, we'll have our end customers do an evaluation with their systems, with their technology, with their users in their environment. Um, so if somebody asks us, what is our accuracy? It's 99%. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not really meaningful because frankly, every authentication vendor will claim two nines, three nines, five nines. Um, the key really is, does it work for your workflow? Does it work for your users within your environment? And I think with any technology that appears sufficiently advanced, uh, you know, it's almost, it almost appears too good to be true. It's somewhat like magic. And so the, the key really is, um, if we deploy this in your environment with your users, with your workflows, um, do you then feel comfortable about moving forward with it? And so we've been very, very successful with that, where we actually just give people the opportunity to test the system. Um, and make sure that it, it passes their, their requirements. So what is the processing capacity or capability of your algorithm? 
Yeah, it's highly scalable. I think one of the advantages of not looking at the contents of, of the streams of data that we're collecting. Um, so to use the keyboard example, we're not looking at the keys that are actually pressed. So we don't need to store um, text. We don't need to uh, sort of be privacy invasive in, in that manner. But the, the benefit is actually it's highly efficient. So we can scale to tens of thousands of, of users um, with a very, very low uh, compute requirement, um, which has been very, very beneficial. So our customers predominantly are mid-market and enterprise, um, you know, financial services, critical infrastructure, federal government. And so really we're, we're talking about high volume of users who we're having to authenticate on a very regular basis. So on what devices does your system, you know, or your system is, uh able to perform? Is it uh, on desktop or all kind, different kinds of systems? Uh, mobile devices, every one of them is covered? Uh, is more, yeah, more or less. So again, we have those two products. We have Pluralock Adapt, which is an initial authentication product. That's really designed to be integrated into existing authentication workflows. So we support uh, ADFS, SAML, OpenID Connect, but then we also have a, a JavaScript integration. So if you have a web application, maybe that was custom designed um, and you have a login page, you can just include our little snippet of JavaScript um, and then be able to provide that invisible level of authentication. So that's quite popular. On the Pluralock Defend side, which is our endpoint agent, we have endpoints for Windows and Mac. And then we also have a, a, a JavaScript agent as well for embedding into other workflows. And then on mobile, we have both an Android and an iOS SDK. So that can be integrated into other applications. Right, right. That, that, that's good. That's, I'm glad to hear that. Now, human behavior, it changes with time. You know, how we behave when we are 10 year old to how we behave when we are 15 year, 20 year, 25 years, and depending on the circumstances or the day of the time, you know, uh, or, you know, environment, we, our behavior always changes. So does your algorithm uh, promote a strategy for a dynamic pattern store that allows it to evolve with the user changes or is it... Uh, Steady. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So again, you know, going back to what I was saying about that organic drift, we've, we've already accounted for a certain amount of what is normal organic drift for, for a person. Um, you know, you mentioned the distinction between a 10 year old and a, and a 25 year old, but there actually is, there's already organic drift between what I was doing six months ago to what I do today. So we look at that on a daily basis where we're continuously appending and updating a user's profile on what is the authorized activity that we have seen and how is that maybe potentially new compared to what we have seen in the past. So that's, that's, an, important, uh, that's an important piece that we're able to, um, to build into the updating algorithms. But I think most importantly is we're able to do that uh, completely autonomously. So it doesn't require any human input either on the, on the part of the end user or the administrator to be able to affect those changes. It just runs uh, programmatically in the background. So uh, your company or system is uh, fairly young. I mean, in number of years, if you can say, you know, that you have been, uh, it has been developed and it has been tested, uh, you know, on the ground. Uh, so. Over the years, you know, whatever time you have got to test the system at client side, you know, on all different kinds of industries, what has been learned about users' behavior when it comes to authentication through your system? What insights you have got about user behavior? Because it's you're not just doing it for you know understanding uh, or letting you know everyone uh, access the system, but because this is a machine learning algorithm, also you also get a lot of insights into you know how users are. Not, how their behavior is and you know you you understand a lot more than what uh, is involved in the you know authentication of a digital user so what insights you have got about uh, the human user especially you know in different work environments what they do what they you know prefer there, there's a lot of interesting insight that you know an algorithm like the yours can get into you know human mind Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the biggest thing that we've found is that every work environment, regardless of company size, is not homogenized. So regardless of if you have a company of 50 people or 500 people, there are always exceptions to the way people go about their day. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think that I think the 
some of the assumptions um, have been historically that if you if you buy 50 computers for your 50 employees and you set them all up in a row and you configure them all in the same way, that they will behave in the same way. And the reality is that regardless of company size, there are always going to be exceptions. There's always going to be shadow IT that's in place. There's always going to be variability in how employees do their work, um, particularly for the IT staff. They're, they're usually the ones who are um, most variable. Uh, and so it's quite common that we'll have a, an organization whose policy is that there is no remote work. Uh, well, of course, up to COVID um, uh, before, uh, before the current, uh, uh, current situation, you know, the, that you had to be on premise in order to, to access data, you had to be in place in order to, uh, to affect change. And when we deploy our systems, we actually have a flag that allows us to identify if somebody's working locally or remotely. So it's just one of the signals that we collect. And it's quite common that even for organizations who, who, who say that they don't work remotely will have employees who actually do. Now, that's neither good nor bad. It, it's not inherently um, uh, risky or not. But what is important is just to understand and be able to account for these different work environments. I think, uh, you know, I think that the, the trend of, of BYOD, where you're bringing your own device, um, has definitely exemplified this, where you can't just accept um, that people will only use their corporately issued devices. People are, are more dynamic than that. They want to log in from home. They want to bring their own laptop in. They want to have their own phone with them. And so you need to be able to handle that. And so one of the key insights is just for any, uh, for any IT system, let alone a cybersecurity system, to be able to acknowledge that fact and be able to accommodate that fact um, so that you have workflows. So what happens when you do detect somebody who is authorized, but they're connected in remotely to sensitive data? How are you going to respond to that? And do you have the right controls in place to make sure it's, it's the right authorized user? You know, one of the questions that we hear quite often is, okay, I don't want to allow people to work remotely because I don't know who's on the other end of that, that device. Um, certainly we've seen instances where um, organizations have moved to an offshore model. And so they, they no longer have people coming into their, uh, their skyscraper in a downtown city, but now a lot of that, that data processing work or what have you has moved off to somewhere, um, somewhere else. And so if you don't have physical, physical controls to ensure that it's the right person, how do you know that when they log in in a time zone 12 hours away, that it's in fact the authorized user? We had one case of, um, of, of a financial services company, they had uh, uh, gone through a very extensive background process check for uh, people that they brought on board into their remote um, data entry center. And they went through, they interviewed candidates, they background checked, they reference checked, they tried to do all of the right things to make sure that they were the authorized people. And what they found was that after those, um, those applicants had been interviewed, background checked and reference checked, the person who walked into the office on day one was not the same person that they had interviewed and background checked and reference checked. And so they actually had, they had a, a fraud situation where it was an employee fraud, um, where they just didn't, they didn't actually know who was accessing their data. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's a really big problem if you're a large organization and you, you have multiple disparate offices around the world. It's a major problem today when everybody's working from home. And so how do you know that the person who logged in at nine o'clock in the morning is still the right person at, at 11 and it's not their spouse or their kid or somebody else who suddenly sat down at the laptop and you've now exposed personal health information to people who are not authorized to see it. Like that's a major, that's a major problem. So those are some of the things that we've seen. You know, I, I, we've also, we've had a few situations where uh, we had a report that the system wasn't uh, wasn't operating correctly, and so we we investigated and said, well, what's the problem? And it turned out that it was a uh, um, somebody rather senior who was connecting into um, uh, connecting into the system from home. It was very late at night, and the system was was locking them out. And the the, the problem was. Um, that the person had had uh, uh, a few cannabis edibles and they were not behaving in the same way that they regularly do. And so the, the conversation was, well, well, your system's not working because, uh, you know, I was the authorized person. In fact, their behavior was so altered um, that the system was, was very suspicious and said, we don't think that you're you. 
um, you know, we need you to, to, to step up. So, you know, those are, those are some of the things, obviously there's, uh, there's examples of data risk and so on, but you know, those would be the trends that, that we've seen in the past. Right, right, and I, I understand that. Now, an important issue in behavioral biometric based authentication algorithms like the one that you've created is whether uh, one has uh, both legitimate and imposter data available to train the algorithm, right? Because if the classification method is supervised, then the system must be trained on legitimate and imposter data samples. Where, uh, so, where does one, how did you acquire this imposter data and how? did you train that system this is more of an algorithm you know question more than you know about the authentication because you need both kinds of data sets so how did you uh, collect that kind of you know imposter data sets mm -hmm. well, i think one of the competitive advantages we have as a company is the is the training data sets that we've been able to build ourselves so you know there's there's really only two things that uh, differentiate uh, machine learning systems it's the models themselves and it's the data that you train those models on um, and we've been very fortunate to have some proprietary models and also some proprietary data sets to train those models on. Uh, and so then that becomes part of our, our competitive advantage. I think also too, you know, the company got going in 2016, but we had a very long period of research prior to that where, um, uh, where our data scientists were, were working in an academic setting. Um, and so we have extensive peer reviewed uh, journal articles, or, uh, hundreds of journal articles and then thousands of citations to those articles. And so we've had a very um, rigorous approach to building out both our models and our, and our data sets. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's become evident in the type of commercial success we've been able to have, um, simply because uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get those, uh, get those models tuned appropriately. And then to your point, make, making sure that you train it on the right data so that there's not inherent biases built into the decision making process. Good, I'm glad to hear that. So, what is, are there any technical, non-technical challenges that you think still needs to be resolved for your technology? Well, I think going back to our earlier conversation around the variability of work and how that's changing over time, I think given the current situation with most offices being closed and most employees being working from home or, or potentially taking taking some time off, um, either either voluntary or involuntary, I think that we're gonna see a pretty dramatic shift in the way businesses operate over the next six to 12 months. What we're seeing today with our customers and, and prospective customers is that there's there's a bit of a wait and see mentality you know, we're not really sure what the next six months are going to hold, both in terms of the economy as well as how that affects individual businesses. And so being able to predict out in the future is quite difficult right now. I do think, though, that we're going to see a, a greater shift to flexibility, um, much more so even than, than we've had in the last 12 to 24 months. And so businesses are going to be have, are going to, going to have to be able to respond to that, make sure that they have the right um, uh, technology in place both to allow that remote work but then also to be able to monitor and control and make sure that it's the right people who are accessing the right data at the right time and I think that that the paradigm shift of you know assuming that the majority 80 percent 90 percent 95 percent of that activity takes place in an office where you may have security cameras in place you may have turnstiles in place you may have thought through extensively the physical controls, how does that then translate when 80% of your workforce is now no longer in a physically controlled environment, but they're still accessing sensitive data? And I think that there's, um, there's, there's sort of a, uh, there's a bit of a free pass right now in that, uh, frankly, the entire world is trying to grapple with this problem. And, uh, you know, it's just about enabling people to work remotely right now but very quickly it's going to change to how do we enable people to work remotely in a secure fashion and so i think that the whole industry is going to have to um to tackle that problem yes i understand that i hear you on that so what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners about your system your technology and where you are going and uh, what uh, uh, vulnerabilities you see if there are any you know in your system that needs to be fixed but also the strengths that your system brings uh, that would help all the you know global users the organizations to have a, a proper you know secure authentication process for the digital users well, i think the big thing for us today is just making people aware that that technology like this exists i think you you're correct in in 
um, the description that this is new, it is advanced, it's, it's part of the risk-based authentication uh, framework, which is a, a subset of the traditional identity and access management market. Um, you know, I think my big takeaway for, for listeners would be to say, look, if you have a large chunk of your users who are suddenly working remotely and you do not have a continuous monitoring system in place, which is, is required under most, um, most regulations, be it industry regulations or, or horizontal standards like NIST and ISO, um, then you, you probably ought to investigate what you can, you can acquire and add to your tech stack. That would be my biggest takeaway. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be us. Like our, our system for the most part is invisible to users and so it doesn't add a lot of friction. There are certainly other ways of accomplishing uh, similar, um, similar continuous monitoring systems. But I think just having visibility into the identity of who is accessing the data and the systems becomes really, really important. And it's foundational to a lot of other activities. So to give you an example, if, you are, um, if you're a SOC analyst and you have a, a, an incident that occurs, you're gonna run a very different playbook, whether you know that this is a malware infection and this is a, a, um, an automated attack, and the actions that you take are gonna look very different than if you know and have high confidence that it's in fact an insider threat, where it's a, it's a real live adversary, uh, they're, they're not on the right account, and the activities that they're doing um, are still dangerous to the environment. But as a SOC analyst, how you handle those two and how you triage that are gonna be very different. So if you have those signals, then you're in a much better position relative to most of the industry. If you don't have those signals, um, then, I, then I think that it's, it's really important, even for organizations who have said, we're gonna freeze all spending, we're not gonna you know, invest anything in infrastructure. I think that you still need to be able to um, say for the users who are still going about their work, still accessing sensitive data, look, we have high confidence of who the end users are. Yes, no, I understand. So that, thank you so much, Ian, uh, for participating in this round of today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on behavior biometric trends for digital user authentication. And I'm sure our global viewers and listeners are going to benefit tremendously from the information you provided. And as a result, this risk round of dialogue has been of service, and we thank you for that. So Risk Group is a strategic security risk research platform and community, and our strategic security community and ecosystem is the first and only cross-disciplinary and collective community that is made of top scientists, security professionals, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, policymakers, and academic institutions from across nations to research, review, rate, and report strategic security risks to protect the future of humanity. Add your voice to risk groups and get involved in our collective security. Until next time, I'm Jayshree. Host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time.